Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, once again, I'm really, really excited to have my student, friend, uh, just fellow Beatles fan, James Corbett with me. It's just great to have you with me, James. I'm very, very happy about this. Uh, thank you for that. I'm happy to be here. And let me just start by addressing, uh, there was a comment in our last conversation from William L. who says, <laughs> does James have perfect pitch? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, William. Uh, I can assure you that I don't have perfect pitch, but I'm working on my relative pitch. As Vinny can attest to, I just linked Never Let Me Down Again and Wicked Game. <laughs> same verse progression, different key, but it's the same progression. I'm working on well, it. Well, that's the pattern. Yeah, yeah, that's pattern recognition. You don't need to have perfect pitch. In fact, relative pitch in ways is more valuable, and that's what I told William L. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And by the way, while we're talking about the comment section, I, I do love comments. I love reading them. Um, one thing I want to say, I have one guy that's been getting on my blues uh, clues uh, thing on my playlist. And uh, he's asking these intense theory questions. And the thing is, he if he he probably jumped. I call the blues thing level three, not level one. Level one is where it all begins. So he's asking me questions about the modes and this and that. And rather than write a book to the guy... You know, I just want to let I, I gave him links to where he should look on my uh, fragments of Infinity series so he could figure it out. So, in other words, if you have like a heavy theory question, go ahead and ask. Uh, but you know that I will refer you to, to one of the videos. Even better, take lessons from Vinny like I am and you will have your <laughs> questions answered in length, at depth and one on one. And I can attest again, I do not have perfect pitch, but I'm working on my relative pitch. I'm working on my theory. It's coming along slowly and I wouldn't mm -hmm. be anywhere near where I am without Vinny. So please, if you are interested, consider it. It's not just guitar lessons. It's music theory, composition, arrangement, you name it. Thanks for the thumbs up, James. And, you know, James has really come very far. It's really the truth. I mean, uh, it wasn't exactly a beginner. You weren't a beginner when you came to me. But uh, at this point, you know, he, he was banging on an acoustic guitar back then, kind of strumming a few. I taught him some of the principles of basic strumming and all this. And now he's a composer. He's started his own band. He's playing electric guitar. I mean... What and I know so Space that? Oddity's rhythm better than that guy on YouTube. I tell you. <laughs> All right. Anyway, <laughs> let's get into the real reason people clicked on this video today. Things we said today. Okay. How do you want to start this off? Should I start with the Beatles Bible thing or do we need an introduction? What are we going to do? Uh, well, you know, I wanted there was one thing I wanted to hit on real quick before we got into the meat and potatoes of this is you and I had a discussion uh, and I said, I said, uh, like, for example, we have a difference between, like, I prefer uh, um, Penny Lane and You Like Strawberry Fields. Both released at the same time. They could have been A and B sides if they were. I'm not even sure if they were. They might have been. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a double A side. Brother and sister songs. I yeah. mean, they're yeah, yeah. so connected. Yeah. Um, both both songs, you know, reaching into their childhood. In any case, uh, it got me thinking there are cat people and dog people, and there are people who like both cats and dogs, right? So I started to think about this this really existential question of perception. It, when I see the color red, is it the same mm. experience as yeah, yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. else seeing the color red? Or do they see a totally different color, but they equate it? So I was having red. the exact same thoughts this week. I was thinking yin and yang. And everyone's got a little bit of both. You know, the seed of one is in the other. But which one is more predominant? And, you know, maybe I'm more yin, you're more yang, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and that's the beauty of the Beatles that brought it together with John and Paul, and they're, when they are together and they're working with each other, the, it's just, it is the unity, it is completion. That's what made them great, and I consider the, 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 the genius is, the Beatles were, uh, the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. I mean, that's what it came down to. The genius of the Beatles was not one particular guy in the band. It was the group mind that made them so good. But, you know, it, it brought me to thinking about a great subject for a, a little video I, I might consider doing is I thought that the, listening to the Beatles is like interpreting a poem, like an abstract poem. Somebody gets this meaning, somebody gets that meaning. And it got me thinking, I purposely looked up real quick today what bands say they, they owe their direct influence to the Beatles. Now, check this out. This is just a short list. Kiss, Aerosmith, Black Sabbath, The Pixies, Nirvana, 
Brian Wilson, Billy Joel, Bruce Springsteen, Fountains of Wayne, <laughs> Squeeze, and XTC. Uh, you know who was missing from that list? A, a lot. A well, yeah, about a million bands, but the Smashing Pumpkins, of course. I See, oh, I'm the from the, uh, the the Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, that strain of Beatledom. <laughs> and there was another mm-hmm. strain that went the other way. <laughs> Right, right. But, I mean, you know, I remember one time I saw this uh, sculpture, a Tibetan sculpture of a dog, and it looked more like a lion than I, a dog. And I said, ah, that's proof that people perceive things differently. If that's how they see what dogs look like, and I see them differently. And just, but in any case, I thought it'd be an interesting podcast to, to look at, okay, what in Bruce Springsteen, mm. what did he draw from yeah. the Beatles? Yeah, what yeah, did yeah, yeah. Uh, Nirvana draw right. from the Beatles? Yeah. What did Kiss draw from yeah. the Beatles? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I would say just fame. That was there. Like mm. Beatles are famous. We want to be famous. Where yeah. if, if you took something like XTC, they weren't copycat. Mm. They were brilliant. XTC was brilliant, but they weren't copycat. They were just really smart. And that's what they wanted to. What they found in the Beatles was that intelligence, and they wanted to put that intelligence into it. Yeah. You know. So that I thought that'd be. An that would be an awesome series. I would watch the hell out of that. So you should make it. Okay, cool. Well, uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll get into it. lazy me. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But in any case, getting to the song, why don't, why don't we play, we're talking about things we said today, and why don't you play a little clip of a cover of the song since we can't do the real thing. You say you will love me if I have to go Somehow I will know Someday when I'm lonely Wishing you were so far away Then I will remember The things we said today Now, first, let's take the big wide picture first It's something I always love to do Is just see it from the bird's eye view so what does that mean? We're looking at the, the actual architecture, how the song is structured, where's the verse, where's the chorus, all right? And uh, now, you can easily say that this is the A part, and this is the B part. Right? And then it comes back. Now, that would be, this is the form I came up with here. Okay, now so we have the A minor section to the C chord section, A minor section to the C chord section. Then we have that bluesy middle, which bridge. I would call the chorus, then, but it's the C. I get it. All right, yeah, we'll we'll discuss that for a second because really these terms are very vague in yeah. pop music. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. Okay. Now what I did was I kind of suggested no, really A and B are one thing. All right, they're all part of the same verse, and one reason. To think, like if you, uh, are you familiar with the song Tangled Up in Blue, Bob Dylan? You've mentioned it many times. I've heard it before. All right. All right. So basically, after he gets through with his verse, at the very end, he says, Tangled Up in Blue. And that's your hook right there. Same thing happens with this song. And here's the title. Things we said today. So the title comes at the very end. That's why I like to think of the A and B that we looked at as actually being one thing. And it makes the uh, the architecture easier to, to understand. So now we have A, B. I mean, A, A. Then yeah. That, that, that makes that into is, the chorus. That's the way I think of it. Like right. the verse is that A, B mm-hmm. part. Yeah. And one thing I love to say about the Beatles, they follow this form where where two-thirds of the song, you're going along, going along, and then finally you get, like, uh, two-thirds along, and you get to this change-up, you know? Uh, and that was a kind of Beatles, if you want to call it a formula. Uh, you know, but it's a great... It's a great I, I mean, I was doing this thing when I was 16. I'm looking at, like, how do they put this together? And uh, I, to me, I, it's a good form because it's like... You bring something exciting to break up the monotony of the previous stuff, even though it's mono- not monotonous. Well, that's the thing, yeah, because the standard is verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, done, whatever, something like that. But if you make the verse into kind of a multi-part thing, 
then it maintains interest for more of the song. And then when the chorus comes in, it really changes things. Mm -hmm. So right. yeah, it kind of delays so, that, but in a, in a way that's not monotonous. Right, exactly. In other words, if it had continued on with another A, B, it yeah. would have yeah. become monotonous. You that, know? Would, that would be so, terrible. Yeah. And it was good enough for him to repeat it, too, that, that bridge section. Okay, so right? let's look at it musically. Um, here's a stupid question to start things off. I'm the everyman in this conversation, so I'll ask oh, some stupid you're, questions. You're, you can just, okay, all right. <laughs> you don't hear the 7 in the E minor? It's a straight E minor? It's not an E minor 7? Oh, wow. Uh, I would, you know... That's E minor 7. Uh, I'm not that's hearing That's a straight that. E minor. Yeah, I agree. I'm just, I'm just saying that the tab sites <laughs> might have Are it wrong. Are they doing E minor 7? <laughs> well, if it, if it is an E minor 7, it's not this one, uh, where the, the 7 is up top. No, 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 no. It has no, to be no, no, buried no, no, no. in there. No. Yeah. Yeah. And that could very well be. That, that sounds like... That could well be. I mean, I don't know for sure. Uh, I, but I'll, we'll get back to you. That get back on that. We need the songbook. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now, um, when we look at it in the second, this version I came up with, uh, the sec, there's going to be a first and second ending before we get to the next part. Okay. So what does that mean? Let's first of all let's look at um, the A to the A. All right. The verse to the verse. First of all, <laughs> one thing I love about the Beatles and what makes them so great is the, the word is subtlety. They they put things in there that are virtually not noticeable. Like if you were to listen to, say, Burt Bacharach songs, he'll put in a bar of 2-4 in the middle of a 4-4 four, four thing, and you'll hear it. You'll hear, oh, this is a little hiccup there. When the Beatles do it, it's barely noticeable unless they want you to notice it. Now, in this case, it's barely noticeable. I don't know if you know this, James, but the first verse is actually 17 bars and not 16 bars. I wouldn't have said that off the top of my head, no. Hmm. And the reason why is... Um, So yeah. that little yeah. fanfare there on the guitar. By the way, that's John Lennon playing the guitar on, yeah. the, on the acoustic. So that that uh, kind of harkens back to the intro, which is why it makes mm -hmm. a good a good way to segue back into the A from the A. Yeah, and I didn't stop to think of why did they do it. I think I did that when we were doing it. Won't be long. Where it's, I I figured out why. Uh, in this case, I mean, if I were to speculate, they're thinking of <laughs> as a kind of hook, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but they could have easily put it on things we used to do. Mm. But then it, it kind of strings out and it sounds like there's an empty spot. Yeah. Where if you things we used to do. So, I'm, I'm assuming they just put it there for effect to kind of bring in that thing. Um, you know. Um, it's a divider. So, it's like a. It's a and yeah. now let's start again. Yeah. I get it. What we in my band, the blue kind, I I, I I coined this term. When you have a tiny little bridging piece between two verses that doesn't really belong to the song much, I call it a bridget. So, yeah. So that's a bridget. Uh, and why it would have a first and second ending is because when the first time. <laughs> right? So. The next time it's things we said to the So he goes to that sunshiny A major chord mm, there. Mm, okay. mm. All right, so uh, now my question is do we go on with the form or should I start uh, looking at the progression? Because we haven't gotten to the, the next section yet. Let's um, look at the progression. All right, let's look at the progression. Now, this is interesting. I never knew this before. When I played this song at a party, I would start off going, right? First of all, it's a short little 
two bar intro, typical of the Beatles trying to keep, you know, within pop standards, the song's got to be short. Um, all right. So, uh, what was my, what was I going to get to? Uh, oh, they don't actually on the intro, John stays on the A minor chord. The chord doesn't change. All right. You go, but you hear the bass go, it goes from A, A to E. So giving, giving almost the effect of the E minor coming in, but not quite which is a nice, tasteful little move there. And actually, when I heard the song, I heard the logic of that, you know? And again, avoiding monotony, it's slightly different, not quite the same, all right? So now, here's the question, A minor to E minor, all right? Uh, the question would be, now we have two pure chords, definitely generated from the same key, right? But what key? C. Right? C. Aeolian. Right. C. A Aeolian. And, right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But here's the deal. Okay, we have A minor. Here's my nifty little. All right, so if we look up top here. We have the key of C, and we have A minor there. Now, I have the relative strength of the modes in the middle section here. All right? So we have. Ionian is major and Aeolian is minor. Well, that's in the Aeolian position right there. That means it's strong. And the other clue is we go to C. We do go to C. So that's suggesting there's a link to C major. However, if we were in the key of G, we could go A minor to E minor in a Dorian progression, and there'd be no difference, you know? And in fact, it would, could be quite possible to make that song Dorian by adding one more chord in, all right? So there's that situation. But now, why does that happen? As you and I spoke about um, circle of fifths, key families. So the way a key family works is, here's my key of C. You look one key to the left and one key to the right. And those keys are related to each other. All right? So there, therefore, you're going to find a lot of similar chords between those two keys. So does that right? mean... Can you apply that to the modes as well? Does that mean F Lydian and G Mixolydian are strongly linked to C Ionian? Yes, absolutely. However, Lydian is weak and yeah, Mixolydian is right. strong, so so it doesn't work. Quite I, the I same used way. To, it doesn't work quite the same way. No, but uh, let me see. We got we had to go to the key of uh, G to get that A minor E minor. So G would be the Mixolydian, right? Yeah. Right, that would be strong. So, yeah. okay. um, so the strong and you know uh, people that are interested in the mode should really look at my uh, um, fragments of infinity level one because it really talks about these relative strengths of the modes and how. What I mean by strength is its gravitational pull. How strong can is it when it comes back home to the root? And I give all sorts of demonstrations about that. So uh, we have that. Okay, now. Uh, so this is really simple. Now we're in the next section of the A section. Okay, so... Do you have any conjecture about this, first of all? I'm going um, from a C. I'm just interested in the C. Is it C9? C to C9? Yeah. 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 I don't know why particularly, but that's just exactly right. <laughs> I don't know <Yeah>. why. <laughs> but yeah, it's great. Right. Uh, <laughs> C, C9, F, B flat. Um, so this is all coming from this. No, B flat is not from the key of C. No. It's Mixolydian. No. And what's G Mixolydian. No. Uh, G Mixolydian. No, Nowhere C near it. Mixolydian. Oh, uh, C flat. Mixolydian. But, uh, all right, what key is C Mixolydian from? What oh, key God. is it in? <laughs> Don't make me count. Uh, F, G, A, B, C. Yeah, G, there you go. So F? F? The key of F. And look what it does. It goes to F. So we have... A temporary, very short-lived modulation is no way dedicated modulation. And very often, 
when you do a little trick like this to get, it's using something called a secondary dominant to get to one of the chords that are still in the key that, you know, the F chord is in the key of C. Um, but it's not a dedicated modulation. One reason is because F is in the key of C, so it'll easily, easily bring us back to C. That's one reason. Second reason is not a lot of time is spent on the F. If it was, um, now we're in F all of a sudden. All I had to do is hit that B flat once we were in the key of F. All right, now I want to, this is uh, something I want to go into. Um, I realized it as I was looking at this. C9 is just a dressed up C7 chord. C7 is the 5-7 chord that goes to F, which is in the key of C. Now, there, when I was in college, we spent uh, one class looking at a progression called 1, 1 dominant 7, 4, 4 minor, which is this. Now, that, that progression is implied in, say... Uh, It's implied as, right? But when we look at this, in the case of Paul, so C9 or C7, we go to F, but then that B flat. Now, how how is that connected to what would have been from this progression F minor? How is that? Uh, B isn't that the relative connected? minor? Of B flat? No. No. <laughs> G, mi G minor is the relative minor of B flat. <laughs> <laughs> Close. <laughs> Only one step up. Um, well, then, I, then I'm fresh out of ideas. <laughs> Can I throw you a hint? I'll yeah. throw you a hint. Think, think two five. Uh, no. What? Oh, no. No. <laughs> two five. Are we talking two five two five one? No. Not really one. I mean, yeah. it's, it's one of those two fives that. Okay. Okay. If I took um, the key of E flat, okay, F minor would be two, mm -hmm. B flat seven would be five, right? Okay. Yep. 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 But B flat seven acts as uh, what's called a tritone substitute chord, which also very nicely brings us back to C. If you listen to any Fiona Apple, she does that right. one a lot. Right. So no, there was no reference to the key of E flat whatsoever. But what's happening is, what they taught us in jazz school is when you have a four minor chord, you could replace it with what would have been the five, the two to the five, which is the B flat seven. So that's one reason for the B flat. Now, I'll tell you right now, when I did this song years ago with Steve Anders and we were talking about it, I hit a B flat seven. Now, listen to B flat seven in this. Not quite exactly right, but it doesn't hurt that badly. Yeah. It, it sounds like yeah. it, it it's not work. wrong. All right. Um, again, this goes back with what I was saying that um, major chords are either disguised major sevenths or disguised sevenths. In this case, it's a disguised seventh chord. Right. So, um, and what do tritone substitutions do? They resolve down a half step. Yep. B flat to A minor. Okay, so so I that, should have said I mean, tritone uh, substitution because I knew. Uh, yeah, all right. Don't tell me two five. Tell me tritone. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. That was actually <laughs> the other excellent uh, explanation. I should have. I should have led you there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Oh. Anyway, okay. uh, <laughs> and by by the way, a little side note about this song: the style of it. Um, this song could have gone on rubber, rubber soul easily. Hmm. 
Yeah. And it's so much earlier than Rubber Soul. Mm-hmm. But Paul, at this point, was getting into acoustic guitar, folksy music, which you hear on Rubber Soul, too. And uh, he didn't let go of the rock and roll thing, but, you know, he, he definitely was starting to explore more acoustic sounds. You know. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, let me see if there's any other points I could make about the progression at that section. Yeah, we haven't gotten to the chorus yet. Or the B, or whatever you're, the C, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, well, you know, one thing, getting back to the overall look at this, this is, um, we're going to get into the B section now, and, and it's a good point to bring up. This, this song is a great study of relative and parallel. All right? All right, if we look at A minor, its relative major is C major. So we do go to that C major, okay? But when we go parallel, that means we take A minor and make it major, which comes up for that section, the uh, B section. All right. So this is a great study in, in pitting the two against each other. But Paul goes a step further with this A major. Remember, there are three systems. You know, there's modes, there's major minor key system and blues. This, instead of making it like the major minor key system or the modes, he's making it blues. Bookmark that B flat, okay? My my theory is he kind of fell in love with the sound of the B flat and he wanted to use it again because it comes up here. Now, if we listen to this, there's a hint of blues in the first melody line. Me, I'm just. It's very subtle. It's not like you. But it's close. Bending that little blue note. And that's the nuance of the blues, you know. But the real giveaway is the D7. We have an A major going to D7, B7, E7, A major, D7, but this D7, B flat. Ah, he could have gone to that E7 again. He could have done it. These are E7. Right is the is the uh, proprietary seventh chord of the key of A major. Okay, acts it's very it's very close brother to the secondary dominant series. Okay, I include it in the secondary dominant oh, for really? that reason. Yeah, the five yeah, seven like is the, the, the propri- secondary dominant. I consider the five seven of a key a secondary dominant in in only in a sense. I mean, obviously it's proprietary to the key, so why would it be secondary? I get that. But it's doing, when you set out all the secondary dominants, you have to include the primary in that one, in that row of secondary dominance. Uh, for those people that don't know what secondary dominance is, if I'm in the key of C, G7 is the, the dominant chord that belongs in the key of C. But if I go to D minor in the key of C, or E minor, F or G, or A minor, these also have dominant chords that could go to them. So A7 could go to D minor, B7 could go to E minor, and so on and so forth. So you get this kind of tonality. Refresh my memory, B... Does that work for B? B diminished? Does what... Oh, no, no, because you no. can't resolve to a diminished yeah, chord. Right. And remember what I told you, the diminished chord is absorbed by the proprietary dominant chord of the key. In other words, in the key of C, a B diminish is actually the upper part of the G7 chord. So it doesn't have an identity of its own. And in fact, if you were to sit on a, on a diminished chord all day, and I asked you to improvise it, you'd start improvising with a G root. It would be natural. hear it pulling to the G. So the diminished chord is way too weak to actually carry its own feeling of root. It must move if it's a solitary diminished chord. So, yeah. All right, now let's look at this progression. We have A to D7. So D7, it is not a secondary dominant. It can fall into the tritone substitution category. What would it substitute up? Yeah, it's weird, because, like, if I had the key of A, 
uh, it would be substituting for an A flat seven. But if it actually does kind of resolve up to that. It's just very rarely used. It's used in one song by the Beatles that I know of that does that. That would be uh, Honey Pie, the 20s, 1920s. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, McCartney. Oh. <laughs> I don't Think dislike it. I just you know, <laughs> dislike that song in particular. All right. So anyway, uh, we have A to D7. That's saying blues. But then we have B7 to E7. Can you tell me, James, what B7 to E7 would be? Think of the key of A major we're in temporarily here. Uh, well, I guess it's 2-5. Uh Two would be B minor or B minor uh, seven. Yeah. We have B seven. Yeah. Um, well, B seven is the five seven of E. So <laughs> there you go. B seven yeah. to E seven. This is called five seven of five. Ah, yeah. This is okay. What it's called gotcha. in music school, yeah. they call it five seven of five seven in the key of A. Okay. So the E seven, the B seven is a secondary dominant. What's beautiful about this, and what Paul didn't even know consciously, is that when it in the same spot, in the next section, instead of E7, he plays B flat. Which I and assume B is the tritone is a, substitution leading back to the A minor? Right. right, and it's also the tritone substitution of the E7. Oh, yeah. So the first time it goes... And the second time it goes... Uh, so yeah, he didn't even know that, but my theory is that he, he loved the tonality of the B flat, in that, a, in, in that A minor setting, and decided, well, let me see if I could stick it in one more time in this bridge, you know. Well, here's the thing about this song that really sticks out for me. Well, two things, actually. One of which, I am not at all going to denigrate this guy's cover that we're playing here. It's a competent cover. He does it very well. It's, it's a good, faithful reproduction. Except the chorus part, I don't know how to say this in a PC way. Uh, his his lyrical, his vocal delivery does not have the the balls that Paul yeah, does, yeah. and that yeah. that makes that part for me. The way that he delivers it vocally is so important, um, which I will not attempt to reproduce. But the the way he kind of drives that is great. And the other part of this song that I love is the way that the chorus goes back into that verse section. Mm-hmm. It just fluidly, just perfectly, and that's enough to me. It just yeah. lands right there. Oh, it's beautiful. And by the way, we'll get to the lyrics. Like, there's a few things to talk about the lyric, but that's one little point that, and that's enough. Yeah, it's like literally that, the ver- chorus verse. It over that word. It's uh, it's beautiful. It's it's beautifully done. It really is elegant, which is a word that can be applied to a lot of the Beatles music. A lot it's of Pauls, certainly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, elegant is uh, not necessarily yeah. the first adjective I'd use to describe John's songwriting. <laughs> but. Uh, revolution number nine is elegant to me. I mean, you know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you said it with a straight face. <laughs> For a second, I was like, Re- oh, it's a joke. Okay. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there we have the general chord analysis. There's no vertical analysis in the sense of, well, there's one, the C9 rather than the C7. Now we're building that C7 up, harmony proceeding again in two directions. We've been talking about how the chord moves to the chord, moves to the chord. That's horizontal. But how a chord is built is vertical. So um, not too much exciting here in that regard, except that... Uh, you know, he might have that E minor seven for one thing. Like it's not just might not just be an E minor. Maybe it's that softer E minor seven. But the C nine. Now here's an interesting thing. Uh, one thing that really bothers me is like when people are in minor keys and they play as the five chord a, a straight ninth. Um, it's not horrible. I mean, George Gershwin used it, so it can't be that bad. But generally speaking, when we talk in terms of minor, it's usually harmonic minor. And that note, that F sharp that makes the nine, is not in the harmonic minor. It's an F note. So you get... um, um, Right? And 
interestingly, you could also have a sharp nine, which is the sister chord that goes to that flat nine. Hendrix now, would approve. Thing about, <laughs> the interesting thing about the sharp nine is there is no one scale that contains this chord. I, I've heard people argue this, but I, I think in terms of what are legal scales, not like... My idea of an illegal scale is a, is a scale upon which, except for pentatonic, I'm talking about seven-note diatonic scales, a scale upon which on each note you can build a valid triad. If you can't build a, a triad built in thirds, it's not valid as a scale because it's not harmonizing each note. That's just me. I mean, there's a lot of people that think totally different than me about that. And, and I, you know, I, I'm just being kind of picky is what it is. But the, the E7 sharp nine has to be built from an Aeolian scale mixed with uh, a harmonic minor scale. You couldn't build the chord without those two scales blending together. And one, one of my theories is that you have to blend natural, harmonic, and melodic together as one big-ass kind of scale. So, just so, you know, that. Okay. So, I mean, really, that's mostly it for the song. You know, we know it fades out at the end. <laughs> Now, I thought about this. Why fade out? They could have done. Yeah. That would have been a Beatles the Picardy ending, third. right? Yeah. The Picardy third. It would have been a Beatles ending, and yep. certainly they've done it. Yeah. Man, Why that's not? it. They've done it, right? They're looking for something different. Right, exactly. Um, also, you know, if you, lyrically speaking, there may be a little bit of question mark in the song because he's, he's speculating. Now, Paul spoke about his lyrics, and again, pinning a medal on himself about how clever he was, but uh, <laughs> how he's picturing himself in the future remembering this moment in the past now. Uh -huh. things we, we will remember things we're saying right now, you know. Uh, so there's a bit of a question mark there because mm. you can't guarantee no, the future. No. So we're kind of fading off into the distance with no. it rather than being a solid ending. No. Now, I don't think that was a consciously made decision. It might have been a consciously made decision, but I doubt it. There must be a reason why they did not conclude the song. You know, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure why they didn't conclude it and they just did one of those fade outs. I think you're right. I think because the song is ultimately about thinking about the future from a future perspective. We're not there yet. We're still going. Um, it, well, it's that, interesting yeah. because as soon as you hit that Picardy third, I'm like, ugh. And that, to me, is yeah, just right. like, no, oh, I'm glad they didn't do that. Um, well, it could have easily ended on the minor, though. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that I would accept. The fade-out I would accept, but the Picardy third, in this case, it just feels wrong. Yeah, yeah. But I could imagine the temptation was there because he mm, does go yeah. to the A major yeah. during those bridges. Yeah, exactly, you know? yeah. And that's why it's so, it would be so cliched, and it would be so like, hey, woo, you know, everything's happy. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I'm glad they didn't do that. Well, that might have been a, con that may have been a, con you're right, because really he's walking off into that future. Yeah, yeah. yeah and when people walk off, they fade away into right. the distance, right? So maybe that is the connection there, you know? Again, it might not be conscious, but I think the intention was there. Um, yeah, okay, let's put it on the record. This is what Paul said. It was a slightly nostalgic thing already, a future nostalgia. We'll remember the things we said today sometime in the future. So the song projects itself into the future and then is nostalgic about the moment we're living in now, which is quite a good trick, <laughs> if I do say so myself. Right. It has interesting chords. That's the quote. Yeah. It does. It, it does have interesting chords. He took what could have been a, like a kind of folk song almost, and, and he turned it. You put blues in it, yeah. started yeah, yeah, yeah. to rock it yeah, out That's a little bit, it, that's you know? it. Because if it was just that verse section, the A-B section, like, yeah, it could be a song, you could make a song out of it, but it's the chorus that makes it for me. And it's, part mm -hmm. of it is, yeah, because it's the bluesy driving, yeah, you mm -hmm. know, it arrives mm -hmm. in that moment. And then it goes back into, the, like, that combination is something that, I don't. I can't think of other examples off readily off the top of my head. If it was just that A B section, there's a million songs that could be like that. Right, 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 right. And by the way, you know, my initial. I, I, we've spoken about this before, James. But when I did, God bless him, Steve Anders. When I did the whole Beatles breakdown years and years ago on my playlist on YouTube, um, uh, 
one of my basic points was simply that the Beatles used a combination of American harmony and European harmony within the context of one song. And there's a million Beatles songs that do this. You get blues in one sense, and then you get European chord movement in the next, you know. Um, so that, that was my original intention. And you trust me, we're going to keep bumping into the blues inside of the European thing, you know. Because, uh, you know, they're born and bred in Europe, generally speaking, it, England is Europe, and... Uh, and they're falling in love with American rock and roll, which is blues based. You know, so uh, so that. Um, all right. Now, just a couple of things about. Oh, let's talk about the production. Not much. George Harrison, and this is why I tell you to learn your triads. I think I sent you the triad chart. All right, George. Instead of comping with John. Oh, let's talk about. Now. Two, three, four. So, if you can't see my foot, but my foot and my hand are in synchronization right now. That's what I call duple, uh, duple strumming. One and two and three and four. Where one, two, three, four is the meter, right? But this is a hard move to do because you have to. You're going into quadruple, meaning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and right now you notice, I a lot of people what they do is, uh, and it's way wrong, is go. I don't even have to know if I could do that. <laughs> right, because their hand <laughs> is down there. <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't, I gotta practice this. Yeah, <laughs> that's me. The, the trick is you got to snatch your hand back up really quick to do that. I'll do it slow. So. Right. You actually, you are up top at that point. Well, not really. You could hear another strum in If I do that, then I have to make a quick move. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and that was John. That was John playing rhythm guitar on this. So, kudos, John. He was pretty good with rhythmic stuff on guitar. He was the guy who was playing... I always go back to the uh, the Ed Sullivan performance where they're doing that, and and he's just like leaning over, talking to George off mic. You can see him like talking and joking and stuff <laughs> while he's doing that triplet strumming. It's just right, right. Uh, and and uh, there's a moment in anthology where Paul's talking about you know from adrenaline, probably prelude, <laughs> yeah. but from adrenaline, he said we we we'd get so excited we'd speed up the songs, and they showed a clip of them playing. Uh, all my loving at this ridiculous pay. <laughs> you can almost see John going, Paul. <laughs> yeah. No, John was a good rhythm player. I, I gotta give him credit. And George's part is real, real minimal. He does, he instead of using this A minor form, again, this is why it's good to learn the triads, and instead of using this A, e minor form, he uses this triad here, A minor. And this E minor. And for the other section, um, uh, he's doing really. That's all he's doing. Just that's typical Beatles, where the one of the guys will just hit whole notes on the guitar. So. There's that. Um, and really, there's not much to say about the production beyond that. Ringo's beat is, is very, very steady. He doesn't really deviate much. Throws the tambourine in there for a little excitement in the bridges. One thing about the production, though, and this is what you're talking about, uh, about this reproduction of the song by these guys and Paul's vocals actually being very strong, is, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a double track of him in unison with himself. Not in harmony, but in unison. Right. On the chorus or on the whole thing? Uh, on the one day, uh, 
it's it shows up uh, it shows up here's the weird thing it just kind of shows up in what seemed to be random places and when I think that was a technique that was primarily used to bolster the strength of the vocal if it sounded weak so in a lot of early Beatles you hear this unison right um, I, I've never consciously noticed that so I'll have to give that a listen yeah, li when you listen to early Beatles, listen to like them doubling the vocals. Yeah, I can hear voice. it sometimes, Some but I just never thought in this song particularly. Never really heard it. Yeah, uh, fascinating because Paul does an amazing job of it. I mean, he's really, really replicating his voice a second time. Now, I don't know if this is prior to or when ADT started, automatic double tracking, as George Martin spoke about. I think it's prior to. I think it's before. Uh, besides that, it would have a different effect. It would sound like it's it's uh, like a speaking of which, uh, slightly off topic, but on the same album. Um, when you think of "If I Fell," do you think of it with double tracked that intro section? Do you think of that with double tracked vocals? No, I do not. No, That's I do not. I do not. I've never heard the double tracked version. And then I was like looking for it on YouTube one day and I listened to it and I'm like, what is this? What's going on? <laughs> this isn't how it's supposed to sound. It sounded so horrible to me because I'm so oh, used wow. to the single track. But they did a double track version for, I guess, maybe the stereo release or something. I don't know. Oh, maybe for the stereo. Yeah. yeah. But it yeah. just sounds so wow. bad. Like, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there are so many purists that, that, you know, they say that, you know, when the Beatles recorded mono, you should listen to it in mono. Don't go for the stereo remixes. You know, don't do that. Uh, you know that. You know that. Like, there are purists that believe that. I, I kind of do, except you were right about Sgt. Pepper. The remix of that was awesome. It really was. I, I don't see anything wrong with doing that. Okay, so you're starting to fade, I could tell, and we're coming close to the edge of this thing, so... Um, Let's see what else is there to say. Real, just real quick about the lyrics, um, which I didn't write notes for. But the point you brought up, uh, and that's enough, is the end of a sentence. And that's enough. But he does this clever thing where he brings it into the, the verse, and that's enough to make, make you mine, mind, which I think yeah. is great. Yeah. yeah. Now, really, here's another yeah. thing. Me, I'm just a lucky kind. Love to hear you say that love is... Love. <laughs> now, I, I looked up Metro lyrics, and they said love is luck, right? No, no, no. Right. Love is love. That's what I always thought it was. When I saw luck, I thought, oh, was I mishearing things? And I listened closely. It's hard to tell, but when you get into the later one, the later bridge, you can hear it sounds closer to love than luck. And I hope it is, because when I was 15 years old, I wrote a song called Love is Love, and subconsciously picking up on his lyrical cue. I didn't realize it no. at the time. But, uh, yeah, love love to hear you say that love is luck. That, like, lyrically even. It doesn't, doesn't even make sense. Nah, it's not right. Definitely not. Well, love is love doesn't make sense either. Oh, no, it doesn't, but I, I actually like that, say. because love. I love to hear you say that love is... Whatever, pink elephants, you know, whatever. It's, a, it's an ocean. It's a, it's a seashell. Blah blah blah. No, love is love. Like I like that. That, well, that simplicity. Well, you know that in an argument, like that would be an, an emphasis. Like no, love is love isn't that. Love is that. Love is love. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it could be. You know, used as a statement yeah. like that. I just realized that in this moment, so that could be. You know, and uh, just the the content of the lyrics is obviously he's speaking about Jane Asher. And this is one reason why I felt like this could go into rubber soul as well, because he start, you know, at this point with Jane, yeah, they're apart a lot and you could hear it in the song, you know, that they drift, you know, they're never always together. Obviously. Mm, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, this goes, to, he goes through a long period of writing songs dedicated to her, you know, write what you know. So that's part of, yeah. All right, so today, uh, in case folks don't recall, we're doing one song from each album going chronologically. And maybe, you know, if, if it gets popular, we want to do it further, we'll jump back again to the beginning and pick another song from each album. So, uh, I, James, I didn't I, actually look it up, so I don't remember which disc is next chronologically. Is it Beatles for Sale? Beatles for Sale, I think, is before chronologically, isn't well, it? Well, we didn't do Beatles for Sale, so it's got to be after right oh uh oh oh 
yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, let's erase this recording and we'll <laughs> start again. <laughs> Oh, I see. I have it as I have it as after Hard Day's Night. My, uh, in my yeah, uh, yeah. It is after. It is after. I think it's the next one, but I I have to find the actual real Parlophone discography, not this silly Capitol Records nonsense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there's some good ones on here. Oh, yeah. I'm, okay. And I, yeah. I like you. I like you making the choice. I really enjoy when you make the choice. No oh, good. So, so do I. <laughs> yeah, there are some very interesting ones. I already have one that I uh, I'm leaning towards, but I won't choose yet. And again, okay, if great. anyone in the comments has a choice, Beatles for sale. What song would you like to see? We'll con we'll definitely consider it. We'll definitely consider it. Obviously. Um, but uh, for the time being, I, we didn't get comments on whether we should stay on the same album or nah. keep moving chronologically. We'll just keep moving. We'll so, come back if, you know, yeah, uh, eventually, yeah. if we need to. Okay, awesome. Great. Uh, plug your stuff. I'm going to tell you, as the podcast host here, to plug your stuff. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and also, James Corbett, if you're interested in what James Corbett does, to me, he's one of the best uh, citizen journalists, if that's one, or independent researcher on the internet. Um, brilliant world history. So if you want to check him out, he's at CorbettReport.com. Uh, and you'll my band is Kodomosan. Uh, Lincoln... Right, Kodomosan. Right, if you're right. in Western in Japan, Japan, you might you have a chance to see us next month. <laughs> Biggest hit band in Japan right now. <laughs> We're hot. big in Japan. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I'll give links. Yeah, I'll, I'll put out yeah, links for, oh, yeah, for yeah, your yeah. stuff. All right, but you and me. Well, uh, you know my YouTube channel. Uh, I have. Um, let me see. I have my Facebook fan page. I'll put that on there. I have. Um, uh, I just started a Spotify where I'm doing cover jazz cover versions of songs, not original music. So there's that. I'll be putting in a link to my different CDs, Loop Du Jour which is uh, actually my favorite of my two CDs. And the other one is uh, uh, Razumataz. Put links to that. What else? What else do I have? Um, got a SoundCloud. It's kind of experimental, weird stuff on there. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be putting in the links in the show notes. So, all good. And take lessons from him. It's worth it. Trust me. Right. And there's many ways to contact me, obviously, if you're interested in less of lessons. I work on Skype and it's doable, as me and James have discovered. I believe that James is my first Skype student. Is that right? That could be. That could be right. Well, it works for us. Yeah. Yeah, it works for us. We have a lot of fun. And this is a lot of fun. And thank you so much for joining me, James. Really, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Thank you. See you next month. Okay. See you next month, man. Take care.